Thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, my name is Natalie Fertig and I'm the cannabis policy reporter at Politico. And I'm joined today by Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who is the uh, co-founder and co-chair of the Congressional Cannabis Caucus. Um, I like to refer to him as the unofficial cannabis czar of Capitol Hill, because in the two and a half years that I've been covering cannabis, there's no lawmaker that knows every single piece of cannabis legislation happening on Capitol Hill like Congressman Blumenauer does. So if there's anybody that we should talk with about cannabis policy, it's definitely this congressman. So I'm excited for this conversation. Um, congressman, thanks so much for being here today. My pleasure, Natalie. Um, uh, we've talked a lot of times about cannabis, but I think a lot of people don't know your history with cannabis policy and how it dates all the way back um, to Oregon State, where you're from. Could you kind of really quickly give us a history of how you got involved in cannabis legislation and you know, how it has changed from that point till now? Sure. Well, I was a child legislator in the 70s in Oregon. And at that point, Oregon was deeply involved with a variety of areas of decriminalization of uh, chronic late stage alcoholism, uh, and it focused on cannabis as well. Oregon became the first state to decriminalize cannabis. And in fact, uh, I think we were the first state to actually vote on full legalization. We had a proposal that would have authorized two plants for personal use. So I've been involved in this since the 70s. Uh, I have been deeply involved since I've been in Congress for 25 years, working on trying to end the failed war on drugs. Uh, we've been involved with state issues uh, around the country from Bangor, Maine to Santa Barbara. Uh, it has been really exciting to watch uh, building on that Oregon experience uh, so that we have now moved to state legalization and making progress on the federal level. But it's all part of that 25-year uh, history. Yeah, and how has that really changed in the last year or two? Uh, I mean, just the events of 2020 seem to have really rocked the boat for how the country perceives cannabis. Yeah, well, we have a couple of turning points. In 1996, California was the first state to legalize medical marijuana through an initiative. In 2012, we had the state of Washington and the state of Colorado uh, legalize adult use. Uh, and it's kind of built from there. You're right, this last year, this last Congress was a watershed moment for federal legislation because we had the Moore Act, which was the most comprehensive piece of cannabis legislation that passed the House uh, with uh, 228 votes. We had the Safe Banking Act, uh, 321 votes. It was the first major legislation that passed out of a, of a substantive committee and passed on the floor of the House. 321 people voted to allow full banking services for the cannabis industry. And then we had a research legislation. So this was a watershed moment for congressional activity. Um, and it's kind of exciting. We're in the strongest position we've ever been. Yeah, and how has the focus on criminal justice reform in 2020 also shaped the conversation around cannabis on Capitol Hill? That's a very important point. In, in a year when there were cries across the country for racial justice, uh, one of the most obvious manifestations of the inequality has been the failed war on drugs that was visited primarily on young men of color, particularly young black men, uh, destroying maybe a million lives. Um, and in this last year, People focused on that. We were able to, in the Moore Act, have uh, criminal justice reform, have uh, uh, access to uh, uh, trying to expunge records. I mean, this, this came into full flower and it brought forward the people who are dealing with equity and justice to be part of that and play a major role. It's really exciting watching that come into full flower and add to the momentum for those that just care about medical or care about civil liberties. 
uh, who, are, who care about personal freedom. But the racial justice element is strong and adds extra momentum. Yeah, I really believe just in the last two to three years that I've been covering this, it seems like in 2020, that part was always uh, one of the many reasons why people supported legalization. But in 2020, it, it's very much shot to the top reason. I, and I feel like the Moore Act's passage, when I spoke with you, um, when the Moore Act was coming to a floor vote, I spoke with other lawmakers, um, you know, Chairman Nadler, even senators, as they were watching the House vote on this, everyone that I talked to mentioned, uh, you know, George Floyd and the the push for criminal justice reform as being one of the main reasons why that bill came up last year. Absolutely. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, the failed prohibition of cannabis has been directed primarily to people of color, especially young black men. They are arrested or cited many times. Uh, the four to one is a commonly used metric, but if you dig deeper and look at various parts of the country, that disparity can be much, much higher. And then we've seen in the case of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, we've seen drug busts, uh, starting with cannabis that have gone very, very bad and had tragic results. Um, and last but not least, we, we have uh, thousands of young black and brown people behind bars uh, for something that the majority of the American public no longer thinks should be illegal. Yeah, and that, that actually segues into my next question, which is the majority of the American public does not believe that this should be illegal any longer. And, and support even for medical marijuana is almost uniform between Democrats and Republicans. Why is the federal government seemingly slower to pick this up than, I mean, we saw Montana, a, a traditionally red state legalized cannabis this year, um, Arizona, a swing state, not to mention New Jersey, which, you know, obviously a blue state. Why, where's, why is the federal government um, sort of slow on this? Well, Richard Nixon's uh, ill-fated war on drugs, and then Nancy Reagan, just say no, and what we've seen, the wars uh, dealing uh, with drug use, um, really are deeply embedded in federal policy and federal bureaucracy. Um, it's, uh, it's a machine that keeps going. Uh, there's uh, simple uh, research uh, is prohibited because the federal government interferes. Uh, that's why the states have played such a critical role. They were not constrained by this federal bureaucracy and the political intransigent. Um, we were seeing steps with the Obama administration moving. They, when the states uh, first approved adult use, uh, Cal uh, Oregon and uh, Alaska followed uh, Colorado and, and uh, uh, Washington state. Um, the Obama administration made a decision and it was uh, captured in the so-called Cole memo, uh, a, a deputy attorney general that basically allowed states to go forward as long as they followed their own guidelines and there wasn't leakage into uh, the general population. Uh, they were going to respect the state's decision. Uh, but other parts of the federal government didn't. There are, there are 93 U.S. attorneys that can do things around the country. Um, there are these drug agencies that are actively promoting a far different approach. Um, so you, you had the, the federal inertia, you had the prohibitions, uh, from, uh, you know, even research, you, you can't conduct it. it, it the only uh, operations are uh, the legal uh, cannabis for research is one plantation in Mississippi, and it's really not good marijuana. Um, the federal government has been captured. Uh, and Donald Trump, despite having stated uh, on camera, and this shouldn't surprise us that he uh, reneged on something that he said, but he had told people in Colorado that he would respect their decisions. Yet soon after he was in office, uh, he installed uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, a singularly ill-qualified person to manage this transition. In fact, he rescinded 
the coal amendment and tried to make things more difficult. So we basically stopped for four years. But you're right, the public is not there. Uh, support for medical marijuana is essentially universal now. It's over 90%. Uh, and it's taken time to break through those barriers. Yeah, and that support, I think when when there was a lot of discussion about the MORE Act last fall, I heard from a lot of our readers and just a lot of people online and, and around America, just this absolute not understanding why the why Congress could not just vote on this because they're saying it's it's so supported. You know, sixty percent of the country supports legalization of marijuana. Can you explain for those people? I've tried to explain, but I think it, coming from you, it may also shed some light on on why it's still hard to move forward in Congress on legalization. Well, it's it's a complex issue, and it is uh, it has some. Uh, blowback for some folks. This is controversial for some people in Congress. You know, as you said, Natalie, we've we've passed uh, the area of public support. Uh, when I started this, it was opposed by two thirds of the general public. And slowly we've been educating, we've been building momentum. Now I've seen polls that suggest that two thirds of the American public now supports full legalization, including a majority of Republicans. But that's been slow to take hold. And you have the uh, opposition from the Trump administration. You have groups that are uh, dedicated to trying to uh, maintain the failed prohibition. And you have all the federal uh, bureaucracy that is arrayed against you. Uh, it is just Congress and the federal government that is out of step. I mean, I've been working on this for years. I've never met any single person, whether they support legalization or not, that think there's any rational purpose to deny state legal cannabis businesses access to banking. Yet that has been a sticking point as well. And that was a, a pretty broadly supported bill. Um, but yeah. you bring up the good point of, of the state markets. And one of the conversations that I've heard starting to bubble to the surface as you know we've now reached 15 states that have voted to legalize adult use marijuana and many many more that have medical marijuana markets is protecting small businesses there there comes a point where federal legalization could potentially open up the door for big companies to enter the market and i know talking to cannabis businesses in Oregon, for example, some of the small farmers, the small dispensary owners, the small manufacturers are saying, how do we approach federal federal legalization in a way that still protects the small businesses that we've put so much investment in? And I know that's something that a lot of people involved with cannabis legislation really want to see happen. So as Congress is moving forward this year, even closer to cannabis legalization policy than it has ever been before. How are you approaching the small business uh, conversation? Well, one of the advantages that the approach that's been taken state by state is that there is no one template. Uh, there are a variety of different approaches that have been taken. Uh, there's keen interest uh, to not uh, have massive industry consolidation, uh, making sure that there's a, a space for small particularly if you want to have racial equity, uh, making sure that small businesses that are owned by people of color have an opportunity to have a foothold in the industry, to get a license. And there's been work with the Minority Cannabis Association and work with the state activities to be able to have programs that provide that diversity. Uh, there is a keen interest with the MORE Act uh, that would provide funding for small business. $2.7 billion would be available for small businesses to maintain and enhance their position in the market. Uh, we have our work cut out for us, but I think there's a consensus that we want to make sure that there is diversity. We want to make sure that there are opportunities for women and minorities to participate. And in fact, people who have 
uh, criminal records uh, because of cannabis uh, in ways that might not be uh, considered illegal anymore, uh, we shouldn't shut them out. And that was part of what was done with the Moore Act. And uh, there's keen interest with our partners in the Senate, uh, Cory Booker, uh, Majority Leader Schumer, and my own Senator Ron Wyden to maintain that opportunity. Yeah, and what is the likelihood that the regulation structure of, of a cannabis legalization bill could some people have talked about a slow opening of the markets rather than jumping straight to uh, interstate commerce immediately. Is that something that's on the table? Well, I think uh, moving into interstate commerce actually would help strengthen the industry and the opportunities. Uh, right now, there's an imbalance uh, in terms of the production uh, the legal production of cannabis and the markets. If we had an opportunity to cross state lines with product, it would help balance out supply and demand and hasten that evolution. Um, in fact, we have now uh, a, a legal national market in Canada, uh, in Mexico, they've fully legalized. We have an opportunity for a North American market uh, to develop uh, and be able to provide those uh, opportunities, that space, uh, and be able to have the balance uh, to help us st uh, uh, stomp out uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the black market, the gray market. Um, and that's another priority that uh, we would like to achieve. Yeah, change a little bit. We talk a lot about um, sort of the main things about cannabis legalization are, you know, getting people out of jail, um, expunging records, um, creating a market that is diverse, but there's a lot of sort of secondary ripple effects of drug policy that I think a lot of Americans don't think about, such as access to funding for education or access to public housing. What for you is, is one of those issues that you think doesn't get talked about enough and that you wish that some of the Americans who are watching this panel, we're more aware of. Well, you, you raised several of them that are very important. One aspect of the failed war on drugs is what it did. You know, we, we talked about selective enforcement. Uh, black Americans don't use cannabis any more frequently than white, but they have the heavy hand of the law come down on them. And penalties that were established denying people convicted of uh, relatively minor cannabis offenses, which, as I say, for most people, they don't even think that should be illegal. They can be denied public housing, access to student loans. It can pose problems for veterans benefits. Um, these are all characteristics uh, that are really heavy handed, inappropriate, and they are focused uh, primarily on people of color. Uh, that's one of the most important parts of the reform effort. When we're looking toward the next two years, the next Congress, you know, for two years, we, we have a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress and in the White House. What do you, what should people expect to see happen legislatively? Well, I think it is important for the advocates, uh, to focus on both the House and the Senate. We've already passed the Moore Act in the House, but uh, only about only 203 of the people that voted for it returned. Uh, now there's uh, enough new people that would probably be a majority, but you can't take this for granted. And we have an opportunity to start encouraging more Republicans. We had a few Republicans, but if they listen to their constituents, we can bring them on board. Uh, in the Senate, it, the calculation is a little more complicated. As you know, it's it's a 50-50 balance. And in several of these states, it is still controversial. Even in uh, South Dakota, which passed both medical and adult use, uh, there are people that are attacking it there. Uh, in Mississippi, which passed medical marijuana, the state legislature is seeking to interfere with it. So people need to focus on members of the House and Senate, the power of the concepts here for legalization, for criminal justice, and for health. 
Uh, this is a powerful potential uh, improvement of American health. Medical cannabis uh, has been driven by grassroots support and voters in uh, 34 of the 36 states. Um, it has the potential of reducing the opioid crisis. States that have a robust medical marijuana have fewer overdose deaths from opioids. And it's a lower cost, more effective alternative. So I think what we need to do is have people concentrate on the benefits, take nothing for granted, work to build the momentum, uh, and having, as I mentioned, three powerful, influential senators, the Majority Leader Schumer, uh, Cory Booker, and Senator Wyden uh, in the forefront uh, can help set the table. But advocates, uh, activists are going to have to make the case because it's not quite there yet um, for the majority of senators. For majority of senators, it's still a question. Uh, and the evidence is powerful uh, and the public is there, but the case needs to be made. Yeah, I did speak to um, senators, uh, oh, Senator Rounds from South Dakota just after the state legalized. And he did tell me that he has no interest in working on any kind of cannabis legalization or even um, the banking bill. So I think he's a prime example of a senator from a state that legalizes that is still slow to adopt, as opposed to maybe former Senator uh, Cory Gardner of Colorado, who is also a Republican, but was one of the biggest advocates at one point in the Senate. Well, you're raising an important point, Natalie. And for me, uh, it's the constituents who can change the mind of the politicians. Uh, we've mentioned safe banking. That is overwhelmingly supported. But it's not just advocates for cannabis. Uh, that is, we had the American Banking Association, the credit unions, uh, there's interest across the board from property managers. I mean, this, this is a $20 billion industry. It employs a quarter of a million people. It has tremendous potential for health and economic development. Um, there's over $2 billion in taxes for state and local governments that are uh, starved for revenue. Uh, moving in this space, for better health, better economy, and racial justice, this is a compelling case that can be made. And ultimately, ultimately, the politicians, I think, are going to come around in the Senate. They're going to understand that the citizens demand it. You mentioned my friend Cory Gardner. Cory was opposed to legalization in his home state of Colorado, but he, he noticed that Cannabis got more votes than he did, got more votes than any politician got in Colorado. It was powerful. Uh, and he understood that opposition to that would have negative political consequences. We need to make this case on the merits and the politics. And I think we're getting there. All right, we have a little over a minute left. So I'm gonna ask some really quick rapid fire questions. and. I'd like you to answer them in, in just one sentence, if possible. Some of them might be a little tricky, but we'll see how this goes. All right. So first question, what year did you start working on cannabis policy? 1973. Right. What is the biggest thing that changed in 2020 in cannabis policy? I think the wave broke in terms of the, the, the power of the issue that gained more momentum with those five states, four of them red. Uh, and it just, I think, uh, uh, made a huge difference in people's perceptions. Third question, does Congress or the president have more power in legalizing cannabis? Well, it ha both the president and Congress has that power, but I think Congress is more likely to do it, and they should. Um, the Biden administration can be helpful, but I think Congress should do its job. All right, and this next question, not uh, we're not going to hold you to this, but how many years do you think until cannabis is federally legal? I think it can happen this Congress if everybody does their job, because the public is there, the politicians are getting there and the case is compelling. Right. And last question, um, the Congressional Cannabis Caucus is getting bigger and bigger on Capitol Hill. 
how many members approximately are part of that caucus? I, I We've been a little slow to organize because of COVID and the riot. Uh, but I think you'll find uh, probably 50 or 60 uh, in the near future. All right. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. This was a great conversation. It's always fantastic to talk to you. And um, I really hope that everyone who tuned in learned a lot about cannabis policy. And I hope that you keep track of what we're doing at Politico and then also what the Congressman is doing. Thanks, Natalie. I really enjoy talking to you always. Thank you very much.